Welcome everybody to the latest in the Foreign Correspondence Club of Hong Kong's online Zoom events. Uh, I keep saying that we have bold name global thinkers joining us. And tonight we have Ben Bland, director of the Southeast Asia program at the Lowy Institute to talk about his book. Uh, and it's about the many contradictions of Indonesia's President Widodo. And he'll be speaking with Keith Richberg, an FCC correspondent governor. Uh, but first, I wanted to let you know about our, um, the next uh, event after this will be A Duty of Care, CNN's Arwa Damon Uncovering Wars and Helping Their Child Victims. That will be on this coming Monday, September 28th uh, at 8 p.m. in the Zoom room. So uh, book your calendars for that. And we have some exciting events coming up that will be mentioned, uh, that will be announced soon. So look for those. And again, when we can have events back here in the club, we will do those as well. But right now uh, we are looking for great Zoom speakers. So if you have ideas, please send them along. And I'm not sure I introduced myself. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm president of the FCC. Uh, so I now get to introduce Ben Bland uh, and Keith, who will be uh, speaking to Keith Richberg. Uh, ben is going to talk about how Indonesia, the world's fourth most populous country, is largely unknown and undercovered in the international media. While it's at the largest um, Muslim majority country, it's also a secular, secular state with a vibrant democracy. Its president, Joko Widodo, known as Jokowi, is in many ways, in many ways encapsulate the contradictions of the nation he leads. He's a former furniture maker from humble beginnings and came to embody the hopes of Indonesians hunger for change, but in office he has displayed an authoritarian streak. Ben will discuss his book on Widodo and what the world might make of this man of contradictions. Ben is director, as I mentioned, of the Southeast Asia Program at the Lowy Institute, an international policy think tank based in Sydney. He's the author of the book, Man of Contradictions, Joko Widodo and the Struggle to Remake Indonesia, the first English language political biography of the president. He was a previously an award-winning correspondent for the Financial Times in Indonesia, China, and Vietnam. His first book, Generation HK, Seeking Identity in China's Sh Shadow, was acclaimed for its insights into young people in the protest movement in Hong Kong. And he spoke at the club in 2017, and we hope we'll be able to have him again someday uh, back in the club when, uh, when the world changes enough to allow that. So I give you Ben Bland in conversation with our own Keith Richberg. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, Ben, for joining us from uh, Sydney, Australia, down under. Thank you for staying awake. It's, uh, <laughs> it's two hours uh, ahead of us there, uh, so it must be a little bit getting close to bedtime. So thank you. We really appreciate it. Really excited to have this chat because, as you know, I covered Indonesia myself for a couple of years during the fall of Suharto and also Southeast Asia. So we've kind of uh, trod the same path. But uh, before we get into the book and, and Indonesia, I do want to go backwards a bit because your, your first book was uh, Generation HK, and the subtitle of it was, I believe, Seeking Identity in China's Shadow. Well, this year, as you know, that shadow got a little bit longer with the national security law, and some people are saying that Hong Kong is in danger of becoming another Chinese city. I'm just wondering, how would you update that book now? What do you think Generation HK is thinking and doing at this moment? Well, thanks, Keith and Jody. Great to be back with the FCC, at least virtually, and hope to be back uh, in person sometime soon. I think it'd be really hard to update the book. I mean, it was really a snapshot of a place and time, which, as we now know, has, has really passed. Things have, have changed so much. And a lot of people have written great books on what's happened in Hong Kong since. I mean, I'd re recommend people in particular to look for Aftershock, written by a number of young Hong Kong journalists, which really has a very different take from outsiders like, like me and others. Um, but I, in a sense, I haven't been massively surprised by, by what's happened. I think the seeds were there. I remember when I spoke at the FCC in 2017, uh, there was a, a colleague from the Chinese embassy came along and asked a question, which was more like a comment, which you're not meant to do. Uh, but he basically said, you know, why do you talk about shadow from China? What about all the sunshine? And he suggested I was exaggerating the depth of feeling among young people about mainland China. But I think... Uh, yeah, I've been shown right, but not with any, you know, I'm not happy to see the way things, things have gone. Uh, but in, on the one hand, the shadow is greater. On the other hand, you know, the identity in Hong Kong has deepened. And we see, you know, an amazing movement that developed over the last year. And in a very contradictory way, uh, the Hong Kong opposition movement, the democracy movement, is perhaps more united as a result of all the violence and tumult and pressure from Beijing, more united now 
than it's ever been, even while it faces, you know, these really tough odds, a really tough uh, battlefield against the Chinese government. So it's, it's a pretty contradictory situation, not, not a good one. Uh, but these things, you know, always, uh, you know, there, there's forces and counter reactions. And I think we'll see that continue to play out. That's why I've, I've never subscribed to this talk of, of Hong Kong being dead, because there's a lot of fight left. Yeah. And, and just a, one last question on Hong Kong before we get to Indonesia. I'm wondering, because you wrote about kind of this, uh, this handover generation or the people who really didn't have any memory of British rule as much, but they were kind of struggling with this Hong Kong identity. Isn't that precisely what the mainland wants to stamp out, this idea of Hong Kong localism or separatism? They want local people to feel like they are a part of the motherland, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think th this is the, t the great tension, right? That the more they try to stamp it out, the more they've deepened this feeling of separate identity and the more that they've forced the opposition movement to cohere. So now that it's not just those those 15 year olds and 18 year olds and 25 year olds, but older people too, who, who agree with each other because they've been forced into the same position. And I think it really, there's a strong comparison for me here with anti-colonial movements in Southeast Asian history. And you see that what Hong Kong has, it has common geography. It already had a common identity, it had a common government. Uh, but now it's in a way has a common enemy or at least an outside force effectively that's pushing people and forcing them to get closer together in a sense. At the same time, of course, it leads to a lot of fractures in Hong Kong society. That's clear. But I think we've seen this push and pull, which on the one hand, you know, has oppressed the people of Hong Kong and removed many of their freedoms. On the other hand, it, it's pushed them together and deepened this sense of identity. And I think that that push and pull is going to continue playing out, albeit on a playing field where the, you know, the, the power imbalance is just huge. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be interesting if you can get back here and maybe talk to some of the folks you talked to for the book and see where they are now and what they're thinking now. It'd be great. But I think yeah, we well, un unfortunately, quite a few of them are in prison and more of them will be uh, by the time I get back and others have had to leave Hong Kong. So it's, it's a pretty miserable state of affairs on that front. That's really, that's, that's, that right there is a big statement. Uh, what's, what's happened to the Generation HK? I, I do want to turn to Indonesia, since that's the main topic of today. And I, I wanted to start out by just very generally, really, just asking you why Indonesia remains so little known. Now, I know you're in Australia, and Australians know Indonesia because it's their next door neighbor. But you know, when I go to the United States, even when I was living in Indonesia, I mean, half the people thought I was in India instead of Indonesia. I don't know. If you're from the UK. I'm not sure if in the UK, do they can they find it on a map? Maybe Bali, but other places. I mean, it is this massive country. It's uh, the world's, what, fourth or fifth most populous country, the most populous Islamic country. We always like to write, I used to like to write, that it should be a shining example of how Islam and democracy are compatible. Uh, they should be taking their rightful place in ASEAN, but we never hear much about it. It's very undercovered. Why? This is one of the, the great mysteries and the great frustrations of anyone who writes about Indonesia. I mean, I've wanted to write a book about Indonesia for a long time. And through all my discussions with publishers, it would basically come back to one sort of set of debates. You know, we like your writing, we like your ideas, but can you pick another country because no one cares about Indonesia? Uh, so it's very frustrating. And, and then you get in this position where, you know, as you and Jody have done, and I've done many times, you have to say it's the fourth most populous country and the third biggest democracy, yada, yada, yada. And in a way, the more you have to try to sell it, the more you kind of feel people turning off because you know you have to push it so hard because they're not interested. So it's very confounding. Uh, and one Indonesian tycoon uh, called John Riadi, uh, he talked about Indonesia being the world's biggest invisible object. Uh, which I think is a description I love. Um, and I think part of it, he argues, it's got to do with Indonesia's presence in the outside world. Um, so Indonesia, I think, has never won a Nobel Prize. Uh, there isn't a huge Indonesian diaspora for various reasons. There is obviously in the Netherlands and a few other places, but we don't see Indonesian restaurants on most of our high streets around the world in the same way we see Indian food or Thai food. Uh, so I think there's lots of reasons why. Um, but it's, it's a struggle to get people interested. And yeah, the, the difficulty is the more you push it, sometimes you worry, you just, you just push people away. So it's, it's a struggle, no doubt about it. Even, even within ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, for people watching, you, know, it, you, you would think they would have a bigger voice. And in fact, even with the, the main dispute with China over the South China Sea, there is a part, there's a couple of Indonesian islands there that would fall within that nine dash line. The Natuna Islands, I believe it is, 
I mean, but, but they don't seem to make their voice heard. They don't seem to be a major player in ASEAN. I mean, I, we can talk about the President Widodo, but I mean, has he, why is it that they don't seem to take their rightful place as the leader of ASEAN, as the biggest, you know, most powerful country in many ways? Well, I think the challenge for Indonesia has always been that it has this core foreign policy to be independent and active, uh, which effectively means that Indonesia wants to be non-aligned. It wants to maintain its strategic autonomy. And I think the Indonesian foreign policy community and Indonesian leaders have seen at various times in the past when previous Indonesian presidents like Sukarno were too active in the world stage, it connected to these deep ructions in, in the Indonesian society. So in the 1960s, when Sukarno was leaning towards communist China, uh, you know, it ended up with basically an abortive coup uh, in Indonesia and mass murder of leftists and alleged leftists in Indonesia. So I think there's a sense that it's better for Indonesia to stay out of these great power debates, this great power contestation, and to focus inward on internal security issues, of which Indonesia has many. I think that's one part of it. The second part, I think, is um, I guess it's cultural in a sense. I mean, I, I hate cultural explanations for anything and cultural essentialism, but I think there is a reluctance on Indonesia as the biggest country within Southeast Asia by far, uh, you know, with almost half the population, the biggest economy by far. There's a reluctance to be seen to be throwing its weight around in the region. And ASEAN as an organization, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, really prides itself on this equality between nation states, on some sense of balance. And I think the Indonesian foreign policy community tries to reflect that. Um, so sort of the, the foreign ministry likes to talk about leading ASEAN from the middle, not leading from behind, as some accuse it, but leading from the middle. I'm not sure what leading from the middle means, to be honest. It doesn't really sound like leading. Uh, but I think there's a reluctance there to be throwing their weight around. And you might ask, you know, maybe it's a good thing. Imagine if Indonesia was throwing it, its weight around Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, life might be very difficult for, for Singapore and Malaysia, as they found in the past under Sukarno, when there was confrontasi, confrontation, uh, an outbreak of grey zone conflict. Um, so I think there, there are some good reasons there. And just on a technical point, the, the issue with China, the Nine Dash Line cuts through Indonesia's exclusive economic zone in the Natuna Sea, but the islands themselves are actually not in that area of dispute. Uh, but it's all complicated by the fact that Indonesia says it has no dispute with China because it's its exclusive economic zone and they're not disputing that. But of course, China claims it has maritime rights historically in those waters. And it's, it is one of many pressure points uh, which Beijing is pushing on at the moment, um, as they have done in the last few years. Oh, fascinating. And, and let me ask, you know, the, you know, the last time I was living in Indonesia, 1998, 99, when I was in the Ascot, and that was the fall of the fall of Suharto, you know, the fall of the whole New Order regime after uh, nearly 30 years, since 1965. Uh, and, but, you know, we had Habibi coming in and we had this kind of tumult going on, but eventually you had Megawati get elected and followed by, you know, Gus Dur and Megawati and then uh, Bambang, you know, Bambang was elected, Yudiono. It, it, when I stopped paying attention, I was under the impression that Indonesia was just a big functioning, you know, raucous democracy. Is that still the case? I think in, in many ways it is, for, for sure. Uh, I think when you're looking at Indonesia's progress on any measure, whether it's the economy, whether it's foreign policy, as we we're just discussing, whether it's democracy, it depends where you put your timeline. It depends on your historical lens. If you compare things to, as you were saying, the chaos of 1998, the fall of Suharto, the fear that Indonesia would, would break up, that maybe there would be an even worse military leader who emerged out of the chaos, the sort of thing we've seen happen in Thailand again and again. Um, I think Indonesia's actually done really well on that front. Uh, Indonesian elections are fiendishly complicated, the world's most complicated single day elections when they elect their president and parliament on the same day, uh, but also for the most part free and fair and, and well contested. But I think we have seen on Jokowi's watch a uh, pressure on democratic practice in Indonesia. So there's been a kind of increasingly systematized 
crackdown on government critics. Uh, the very powerful anti-corruption commission has seen uh, the government undermine its powers, weaken its powers. And we've seen Jokowi build this sort of very big political coalition, which means there's no opposition in the Indonesian system. So after two bitterly fought elections between Jokowi and Prabowo Subianto, the former special forces general and former son-in-law of Suharto, uh, after these two really hotly contested elections with black propaganda going back and forth, disinformation, attacks, you name it. Prabowo was brought into Jokowi's cabinet last year after Jokowi's re-election as, as defense minister, which, you know, as quite a few Indonesians remarked to me, you know, what, what sort of democracy is this when you can oppose a guy and he ends up in, in the cabinet? And Jokowi's response to this criticism was, was to say, oh, our democracy is different from the West. There is no opposition in Indonesia. We have what he calls Gotong Royong democracy, which is the Indonesian term for mutual cooperation. Uh, so it's this idea of Indonesian politics working much more through consensus and elite deliberation than the sort of open contestation that we would see in uh, the US parliament and here in Australia, in the UK, uh, in the LegCo of old, at least anyway, don't know about the LegCo of the future in, in Hong Kong. So that's his argument. But again, it's a sort of cultural argument. There's probably something there, but I think it looks to a lot of the kind of civil society activists who are Jacoby's earliest backers, it looks like he's kind of sold out uh, and he's become part of the elite, having earlier come to power as this outsider. And just for a moment, if you would put on your, South, your hat as a Southeast Asia expert, when we look around the region, I mean, in ASEAN, if you leave aside the former, you know, the, the, the former Indochina bloc or the former communist countries, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, the democracy champions were supposed to be, you know, Myanmar, and you look where that is now, the Philippines, and you look how they've gone authoritarian. Thailand in the 90s had a brief flirtation with democracy, and they had talks, and now they've gone back to kind of a military-run rule. Is Indonesia the most open democracy in Southeast Asia now, or how should we... How should we measure it against the other countries around it? <laughs> I would argue it is. Yeah, as I say, it's, it's got its problems for sure. But, you know, the elections are by and large free and fair. There is a lot of money politics, particularly at the local election level. And in the parliamentary elections, the presidential election is remarkably free and fair and open and transparent. Um, a lot of media tycoons have fallen in with Jokowi, but the media still remains you know, very rambunctious. And for the most part, journalists aren't facing the same levels of threats as in the Philippines. There are a number of cases of violence against journalists in Indonesia, but nothing on the extent that we see in the Philippines. So I think all things considered, it is the most robust democracy in Southeast Asia. And that's a good thing for Indonesia, but I think it's it's concerning in a sense when you when you look across the region and this this hope that this third wave of democratization, as it was called in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, would be a deep and lasting shift hasn't come to pass. But I see things in a different way. I mean, a lot of academics who write these books now about how democracy dies, are very depressing books, uh, you know, they would talk about this global democratic recession and global democratic backsliding. But at least for Southeast Asia, I see this more as the challenges of nation building. I don't think, you know, what's happening in Indonesia or the Philippines or, or Thailand has got to do with Trump or Bolsonaro or, or whatever, or, you know, polarization in the West or Facebook. I think these are young countries that often emerge out of the arbitrary limits of colonial expansion that are in many ways facing these deep foundational questions about who's a citizen, who controls power, how are we going to orient the economy? So in Thailand, you see it's that you know, battle between the military, the monarchy and the people still unresolved. In Myanmar, it's the, again, the military versus the people, but also the broader question of who's a citizen? Are the Rohingya citizens? Uh, what about these other groups who are still fighting armed conflicts against the government? In Malaysia, we see the government you know, just collapsed, struggling with this issue of the place of the dominant Malay people, uh, at least dominant in terms of population, not necessarily in terms of economic power. And in Indonesia too, it's these questions about the role of Islam in the state, the question about democracy versus authoritarianism and protectionism versus openness. So I see this really as kind of the ongoing growing pains of young countries emerging out of really difficult backgrounds, which doesn't mean they aren't less democratic. I think, I think they are less democratic, but I think I see it more coming from within rather than being some sort of uh, depressing global trends. Sure. And, and let me let me move on to the subject of your book, President Joko Widodo. Uh, 
in 2014, I remember when he was first elected, I believe that was the first year and he was out there when he was first governor of Jakarta and then became president, uh, people were calling him Indonesia's Obama. It was all about hope and change. He even kind of had a little bit of a resemblance to Obama <laughs> facially, I recall. I mean, what, what, what happened to that hope and change? Did he kind of fulfill that, uh, that role or was that always kind of a role that he was put on more by the foreign press and not locals? I think it was always a slightly odd comparison. I mean, there's, I suppose, a bit more to it. They were both born in the same year, within a few months of each other. And obviously, uh, President Obama did spend some time in Jakarta as, as a young boy. Uh, so I think that was about the extent of it. It's pretty shallow. And I, I think it speaks to that struggle as, you know, foreign correspondents trying to get editors interested in Indonesia. Um, you know, you have to find a framing that will connect with people on the other side of the world. So saying he's the new Obama, um, you know, sort of makes sense. But, you know, Obama in his 30s was this precocious, you know, law, law graduate from Harvard writing, you know, autobiographies about predicting how he was going to be a change-making world leader. In his 30s, Jokowi was in his furniture factory inspecting chairs and tables and putting on an ill-fitting suit to go to trade shows in Singapore and hawk his uh, furniture to European buyers. So it's a rather different approach to politics. They did both you know, get to the top quite quickly, but I think in very different ways. Um, as to how Jokowi seemed, I mean, now everyone will, I don't know if they remember, but there was this uh, iconic Time magazine front cover, which had Jokowi's face. And I think it said a new hope or hope for democracy, something along those lines. And that really summed up this sense from the outside that Jokowi was this transformative figure because of his background as the first person from outside the elite, outside the military, the political elite families, the, the key religious organizations to be Indonesia's president. And the fact that he was largely a self-made man, uh, first as a furniture factory owner, and then as a, a mayor and then governor of Jakarta, who got where he was by dint of his hard work and talents. So I think he did represent a very different kind of character, but I don't think he was ever really committed to a different kind of governance in Indonesia. Um, so in the town hall in so Solo, his home city where he was mayor, uh, you know, Jokowi worked with the powers that be, the same thing when he was governor of Jakarta. So he was never a guy who was gonna push transformative reform, but I think he was quite smart, frankly, in allowing Indonesians and outsiders to see what they wanted in him. Um, if it helped him get to power. And I guess in that sense, there is a, a sort of comparison with Obama, who I think described himself as a, a blank canvas who, you know, he allowed others to paint their hopes and expectations onto him. So I think there's something there in how Jokowi kind of cannily allowed all these different diverse groups of people, Indonesian tycoons, Indonesian, you know, motorbike taxi drivers, foreign investors, the foreign press to believe what they wanted in him. And he used all this support from inside and outside to, to get to the top, defeating, you know, a bunch of people who had far more money than him, far more connections than him, and who'd been far more greedy, frankly, for the presidency their whole life. So it's still quite an incredible, impressive rise to the top, even if and we can debate that shortly, I'm sure uh, you can raise questions about, you know, how he's done in power. Sure. And, uh, how much was he really in the beginning, especially when he, in his first term, was he his own man? And how much was he kind of Megawati Sukarno Putri's candidate that, she, and she was really the power behind the throne? Well, I think ever, ever since Jokowi emerged onto the national political scene in Indonesia, uh, which was probably after he won this uh, re-election victory in Solo with 90% of the vote, that really alerted you know, him to his potential and alerted a lot of political parties and other figures in Indonesia to the idea that this guy has some amazing connection with Indonesian voters that's unique and we need to tap this. Um, so I think ever since he became a national figure, there's been this kind of curious, what I call a love hate triangle between Jokowi, Megawati, and Prabowo. So back in 2012, when, when Jokowi joined the Jakarta gubernatorial race, it was Megawati, whose party he was in, and Prabowo, who backed his campaign. And uh, Pro -Pro Prabowo and his family actually provided a lot of the funding uh, for Jokowi, including, of course, Republican consultants, who gets anywhere in politics without those guys helping you out. So Prabowo provided a lot of the funding, Megawati a lot of the political support. And they both thought, we can use this guy from Solo, who's very popular, to improve our our own reputations so we can run in the presidential election in 2014 and win finally because they'd both failed in the previous election in a joint ticket 
But of course, Jacoby came out and thought, no way, I'm going to use these guys to back me. And then I'm going to steal the presidency from under their noses, which is exactly what happened. So I don't think he's ever been a puppet, which is what Prabowo often accused him of being back in the day, uh, in between them being friends and friends when they were enemies in the intervening period. Um, Jacoby is not a puppet of Megawati, but he has to work very carefully with her to keep her happy because she is the patron, the matron of his political party. Uh, but he doesn't always do what she wants. And she is one of many forces, Prabowo being another one, in the Indonesian political environment who he has to compromise with uh, to keep stability in power, which he's been quite good at doing. But I think policy continuity has been sacrificed on the altar of this broader political stability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and t- talk a little bit more for us about Prabowo, the other the, the, the other member of this triumvirate with, with Jokowi. I mean, he's he's known overseas as someone who can't go to the United States because of human rights abuses. I mean, I remember in the late '90s, he was the one he was the evil head of Copasus, which was going around killing people. You know, and and I want to talk about him in the context of of, of President Widodo and President Widodo's interest in or commitment to human rights and to bringing to justice you know, those who were responsible for the rape of East Timor or who were responsible for the deaths during the night, you know, during the revolution and overthrew Suharto. Do Indonesians still care about, you know, having, having justice or is there some sense of impunity now for all those who were involved? I think in Indonesia, it's, it's been a difficult question, you know, how to manage this transition. I think what happened effectively in 1998 is that there was a sort of de facto agreement that the rules of the game would change to be more democratic, to have more contestation. Um, And the elite and many of them in the military and in other uh, parts of the Suharto apparatus basically signed on, on the proviso that they weren't going to be targeted. Uh, So effectively, the rules of the game changed, but the players stayed the same. And the result is Indonesia never had kind of the sort of deep, deep reform it probably needed to be a whole new country with with a much better functioning democracy and perhaps more social justice and social equity, etc. But at the same time, Indonesia avoided the inevitable mass bloodshed that would have, you know, accompanied that sort of drive to have a total cleansing of the political system. So I think that, I mean, that's what I call kind of the original sin uh, of reformasi, the reform movement in Indonesia, this need for a compromise. Um, but I think it is understandable in the circumstances, but it's meant that not just Prabowo, but a number of other figures, Wiranto, another general from that era, who's uh, chief advisor to Jokowi, he was a minister in the first term. So it's not unique to Prabowo. Uh, broadly, there hasn't been this kind of reckoning. And there is a tension there because when Jokowi was elected in 2014, he did make a commitment to look into these previous human rights abuses. Um, but you know there wasn't much follow through there. I I doubt that Jacoby was ever deeply personally committed to that. It was something that was quite meaningful to the many volunteers, uh, the kind of civil society activists who were on board with his campaign. I doubt he was personally deeply committed to it. It is something he committed to do among many, many other things, but it was soon sort of pushed aside, uh, you know, in favor of political compromise and keeping the system going. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is quite jarring. I mean, Prabowo was, I think, banned from entering the US. Now he's defense minister. I don't think there's much doubt that he would be allowed into the US for official meetings um, in, in normal times when, when, when he can travel. So I think that's just the way thing, things are in Indonesia. And you can argue maybe it's a more sensible approach than the cycle of coups and counter coups in, in, in Thailand that we've seen um, in the last few decades. It's, it's hard to know, but that's the, the solution that Indonesia has chosen and it has its advantages, but it also has its costs too. And it's incredible to me that, you know, Prabowo is still there now being talked about as a presidential candidate, a guy who has sacked, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the fall of Suharto, who went into self-exile in ignominy. Uh, he's now the defense minister, potentially the strongest candidate uh, four years out for the next presidential election. So it shows you what has changed and it also shows you what hasn't. It, it's amazing. It, it really is incredible. As you, as you were researching this book, because you, you know Indonesia, you know Southeast Asia, was there, was there anything that actually surprised you that, that you didn't know about Jokowi before you started researching this? 
I haven't, there was no great surprises simply because I've been working on the book for a long time. It was something I, I started working on when I was a correspondent in Jakarta. It just took a long time to find someone willing to publish a book about Indonesia and about Jokowi. Um, so it's been a long process of trying to get to know a bit about the man and how he leads and how that reflects on, on Indonesia. I think ideally I would have come up with, a, I guess, a, a clearer label than man of contradictions, but I've just always struggled to to get a handle on exactly what kind of leader he is. I mean, I was earlier, I was looking through the, the list of things he's been called, which is a reformer, a liberal, a moderate, a pragmatist, a technocrat, a nationalist, an authoritarian. I mean, it's all utterly contradictory. Uh, there's something in almost all those labels, maybe not a liberal, but something in almost all the others. Uh, and there's also a lot of sort of inaccuracy in some of them. And he still is a guy who will just confound. Um, you know, on the one hand, he seems to be very simple. Um, he doesn't read much. He's not a narrative president. He doesn't give great long speeches. He is a furniture maker from Solo who became a mayor, who became a governor, who became the president in just nine years. Um, he's now been president for six years, but he was only in politics for nine years before that. Um, so in many ways, it's a simple story. But on the other hand, he's always confounding. He sometimes does seem to be a bit of a puppet or he's having his strings pulled. Other times he pulls one over. Those who seem much more powerful than him. He's always doing things that you couldn't predict. And the most recent was, you know, allowing and I guess facilitating the entry of his son and son-in-law in, into politics. His son is now standing for his mayor of solo seats uh, in uh, local elections later this year, which is an incredible turnaround because Jokowi was meant to be the outsider who, who changed the way things were done in Indonesia. And he himself was forged by contestation. It was sort of the competitive nature of elections that I think made him into a, a good, effective local leader. And while his son is facing a rival, you know, it effectively looks to many Indonesians like a bit of a coronation. So that, that sort of came out of nowhere. I don't think anyone would have managed to imagine that Jokowi would be the next uh, Indonesian leader to create their own dynasty. Wow, interesting. Dynastic politics now comes to Indonesia. Really interesting then. <laughs> and and let, let me ask you, what, will, what do you think at, the, at, at this point, he's still got a few years to go in his second term, he's just started, but what's, what do you, what's so far has been his signature accomplishment domestically? Before COVID-19 hit, which I think is something we have to say uh, for all, yeah, all our countries now, if we're trying to look a, a bit deeper and, you know, we don't know where things are going to head. We can talk about that in, in a bit. But before COVID-19, I think his chief uh, accomplishment was on infrastructure. I think Jokowi is a former furniture maker. He really sees the world as a former furniture maker. That's why he had this almost laser like focus on trying to build infrastructure. Under Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, the previous president, Indonesia had this really beneficial economic environment where Chinese demand for Indonesian commodities like coal, rubber, palm oil was boosting the economy. It was going great guns, but SBY didn't really take advantage of that to improve Indonesia's airports, ports, roads, bridges, um, with the result that Indonesia has some of the worst infrastructure in Southeast Asia, if not in, in the broader region. It's really undermines Indonesia's ability to plug into global value chains, the manufacturing industry, and, and really sort of push its economy along. So Jokowi worked really hard in the first term to increase the spending on infrastructure and also, also to overcome a lot of the roadblocks to do with land acquisition and different ministries or local governments trying to hold up these projects for their own interests. So he did a good job there. Jakarta finally has its first ever uh, metro line, MRT line, after something like 40 years of, uh, of trying to get it done, uh, which is quite an incredible achievement, although it's a drop in the ocean for a greater Jakarta area of 30 or 40 million people, but you have to start somewhere. And he made a lot of progress elsewhere with infrastructure projects. I think the challenge was that, you know, he had quite an instinctive approach to politics and to infrastructure. So there's never really been a kind of focus on how best to prioritize projects. It was really driven by, you know, wherever Jokowi is going to go for his next visit, he wants to be seen in a hard hat and a high visibility vest with a shovel, uh, breaking ground on something. So it was a bit scattergun. It hasn't achieved the results um, he would have liked in terms of improving GDP growth, which before COVID uh, was sort of stuck at a 5% level. Jokowi wanted to get it up to 7%. He got nowhere near. And now with COVID-19, Indonesia sadly uh, facing its you know, first recession since the Asian financial crisis, as well as obviously a very concerning health situation. 
Yeah, um, and, and before I ask about COVID, I do want to ask about infrastructure. Is one of those projects going to be this moving the capital I, I, I was reading about to Kalimantan? I mean, is that real or was that just kind of a trial balloon? It's, 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 it was hard to know. I, 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 thought it was, I thought it was real, to be honest. I mean, every Indonesian president since the independence in 1945 has talked about moving the capital as this sort of symbolic effort to shift Indonesia's center away from Jakarta to its geographic center, um, you know, to, to, embo to embody the idea of this archipelago that's recreating itself, becoming more modern. So everyone's sort of talked about it. Jokowi was the first, I think, to really jump on it in a more serious manner. Although he did it at a curious time, just after the presidential election last year, at that time, Prabowo was contesting the results. There'd been violence on the streets of Jakarta. And I think Jokowi wanted to reassert authority by saying, I'm going to announce something big. Uh, let's move the capital. And he had this, it's, I think it's something like 34 billion US dollar plan to build this new city really in degraded forest in the middle of nowhere, 1,500 kilometers away from Jakarta, over the sea. Uh, but I think he was serious, actually, because he's so focused on infrastructure. I think he saw this as his legacy. And I think it's typical of the way he is an instinctive politician. So he just felt it was the right thing to do. And he pushed it. And he kind of brought various groups into line with it because it turned out most of the big tycoons in Indonesia had a parcel of land there. So potentially everyone could benefit from this project, which is probably the only way to make it happen. But it's now officially the government says it's on hold uh, pending COVID-19. Um, but you never know. I think, you know, if, if they get through the health crisis, Jokowi might see this as a way to try and stimulate economic growth um, because he does have quite a statist view of, of the economy. He really thinks that it should be state-owned enterprises and the government in the driving seat, despite his private sector background and a lot of focus on trying to attract foreign and private investment. He also has this kind of contradictory view at the same time of pushing the state's role in the economy, despite the state-owned enterprises having, you know, quite a questionable um, track record in terms of efficiency and profitability, etc. And, and how much of this capital move is, is being, being forced by climate change? How big a problem is climate change to Jakarta with the rising canals and also Indonesia in general? It's a massive issue. I mean, Indonesia is facing all these sort of existing problems that we've been talking about in the economy and, and politics and whatnot. But there's a whole kind of new series of new order problems, if you like, not the new order of Suharto, but a whole series of new economic issues, climate change being one, deepening social inequality and things like changes in the manufacturing um, and global value chains and how that will impact Indonesia. But yeah, climate change is massive. Jakarta itself is sinking because of overdevelopment. Uh, basically, seawater is being sucked in, into the city. So Jakarta is sinking at a, quite an alarming rate every year. It's already subject to quite bad flooding during the wet season. Um, and it has a lot of other health um, issues and urban development issues already. The problem is, by moving the government center to Kalimantan, you're not really doing anything to improve the conditions for the 30 to 40 million people living in Greater Jakarta. You're just moving the government headquarters out of the swamp, as it were, uh, but it doesn't really help everyone else. So I think it's, that's one of the reasons Jokowi and the government gave, but I don't really see how that's going to solve the problem. And just beyond Jakarta, there are so many low-lying areas of Indonesia uh, that are going to face big, big problems um, from climate change. And it was something that Susilo Bambang Yudhiyono thought a lot about, talked a lot about, and he made some early progress there. It hasn't achieved as much attention, frankly, under Jokowi, I think primarily because he's so focused on this sort of developmentalist approach of, of driving infrastructure, driving the economy. And I, I suspect he would view it as something of, of a tension uh, with that. But yeah, very worrying picture overall for Indonesia and for much of Southeast Asia, where the capital cities and the key production zones, key rice growing areas for many of the countries are in these low lying Delta regions. Yeah, yeah, Ho Chi Minh City, Bangkok's got flooding problems. Manila. Manila, you know, but uh, I do want to move on because we had a couple of questions coming in about the, the COVID-19 coronavirus. I had a question as well. Uh, member Mark Michelson asks, uh, President Widodo and his administration have been widely criticized uh, outside Indonesia for a lack of leadership and a slow, slowness in responding to COVID-19. Do you agree? And what are some of the implications? And another question that came in, same topic, was on the virus, how has he done? And should he be declaring a state of emergency? So what, give, us, give us the COVID-19 update if you're, if you're following it there. 
It's a pretty concerning situation in Indonesia. So while in Europe, uh, people are worrying about a second wave, uh, in Indonesia, I guess it's more like the US in a sense, it's an endless first wave. Uh, the first wave hasn't finished yet. So uh, the latest data, Indonesia has something like 250,000 confirmed cases, uh, more than 10,000 confirmed deaths. But Indonesia also has one of the lowest testing rates in the world. Um, so the the real figures in terms of deaths and cases are almost certainly multiple times higher than the official data, which is pretty concerning. It puts Indonesia into a worrying category, not yet as bad, frankly, to be honest, as the US, as India, as Brazil, but, but concerning because of the way it's just been spreading without any pushback, really. And I think we have to acknowledge here that Jokowi and the Indonesian government faces a really difficult situation. Because a lot of governments, you know, to be fair, were stuck in this debate about how far can you shut down the economy um, and how far do you need to protect people's health. But it's particularly acute in a country like Indonesia, where the vast majority of the workforce is employed informally. You know, these are people working as motorbike taxi drivers, as domestic helpers, uh, day laborers on construction sites. Uh, they can't work from home. Uh, it's not possible. So I think Jokowi was genuinely concerned about how to protect these people. I think he was genuinely concerned that people wouldn't adhere to advice about social distancing and the like. So I think he had some reasonable and some unreasonable concerns. The problem is he's, he's kind of withered in the face of this crisis. I don't think he's shown good leadership. The messaging has been very confused. So very early on, he came out and said, I'm withholding information on how bad the pandemic is because I don't want people to panic. He said that on the record to the Indonesian public. Um, <laughs> it is, but Trump said it to Bob Woodward and it was only revealed in this book, you know, months later as a shocking, shocking fact in Indonesia. This, this was on the record right from the start. And we've had a number of government ministers promoting what, what you'd have to call quack cures. Various times they try and play down um, the epidemic, pandemic and say, oh, it's the new normal, just get used to it. Other times they say we have to put health first. So very confused messaging. And the Indonesian health system was already deeply underfunded and really overstretched with some of the lowest rates of doctors per thousand population and ICU and isolation beds per thousand population in the region. Um, so it's a really difficult picture, but I guess the counter example will be somewhere like the Philippines, uh, where Duterte went really hard with the lockdown early on. The economy is doing much worse than Indonesia, but in the end, they couldn't sustain it. So they had to ease off. And now the virus is also in free circulation in Indonesia. So I don't think he's done a good job, but I think he didn't have a good hand. Uh, my concern is that it's very hard to, to pump up the economy when the virus is in free circulation because many Indonesian people, uh, understandably, have been taking their own measures to protect themselves. Um, so it's, unfortunately, it's hard to see how, how you can get out of this bind. And I don't think you can just let the virus freely circulate and expect the economy to, to operate as normal. That's not just it's not going to work. Um, so it is challenging for Indonesia and there's no obvious way forward yet. Yeah, we had a couple of related questions on economics and the virus. Uh, someone, sorry, there's no name on the question, but it said uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who spoke to the FCC in a Zoom panel uh, recently, said countries like Indonesia were already uh, uh, known for their huge uh, uh, inequality, experiencing huge you know, income gaps and inequality gaps, and the virus seems to be widening that. Um, what can be done or what should be done to tackle that is the question. Yeah, it's extremely concerning. I mean, when I was a correspondent in Indonesia and, and since then, you know, you read all these reports from, from McKinsey and PwC and, and other research institutions about how Indonesia has this great middle class and it's got this potential. It's going to be the world's fourth biggest economy. It's going to be brilliant. Everyone's going to make money. Uh, but I think they, in, and a lot of that is true, by the way, uh, but they overlook the other part of it, which is the you know, amazing disturbing high levels of, of inequality. Indonesia has you know, one of the most unequal large economies in, in Asia. Um, and it's not just about financial inequality, but access to things like running water. So it's not just about outlying islands. Even in Jakarta, something like half the, the population doesn't have access to running water. So, you know, what are your life prospects like then? And that's why we see that if you look at things like maternal mortality, child malnutrition, Indonesia is at sort of Haiti levels, like really at the bottom of the pile in terms of those kinds of indicators. It does much better on some other health and social development indicators. So it's a really mixed picture across the country and even within the big cities. 
Um, and something like COVID-19 will obviously make it worse because it's the people who can't afford not to work or have no opportunity to work from home who will then be most exposed to, to the health impacts. And, you know, you can look at the official poverty figures in Indonesia, something like 10% of the country is below the poverty line. Uh, but actually, there are so many more people than that who are cycling in and out of poverty. And I think many Indonesians who are classed as being you know, lower middle class, they live a very fragile existence where something like a family member getting sick, uh, whether it's COVID or cancer or diabetes or dengue, uh, you know, can really pull a family back below the poverty line into tough circumstances. And this will only exacerbate that because a lot of people will be forced to spend through their savings. Oppo employment opportunities are going to be much worse. So I think it's a really concerning picture for Indonesia. Um, no obvious answers. The government has done some sort of good experimentation work with cash transfers, uh, innovative ways to try and get money to the people who need it. Uh, but it's hard because of the bureaucracy and cash transfers can sort of help a bit, but they don't tackle the, the deeper challenges. And for that, you really need more fundamental reform of the education system, of, of the health system. And that kind of thing is fiendishly difficult, especially when you're so economically constrained. Yeah, and, and a related question that came in earlier said the uh, policymakers right now are looking to stimulate the economy, but doing it without further weakening the currency. And the rupiah, they say, is probably the worst performing currency now, down about six and a half percent. And they're asking the questioner asks, what are what are Wadodo's choices? How do you how does it get out of this hole? I think it's it's going to be it's going to be tough. Um, I mean, Indonesia saw through the first round of emerging market jitters. And one of the great problems for Indonesia has always been that something like 30 to 40 percent of its uh, government debt is owned by foreign investors, depending on, on the time. And what happens in any time of global crisis is you have these kind of risk off moments where um, emerging market investors, um, you know, sitting in Greenwich, Connecticut or London, who don't really know much about Indonesia, probably never been there. Uh, they just want to reduce their risk profile across their portfolio. So they just sell down emerging market debt. And so you immediately see the rupiah start to tank, basically, regardless of whether Indonesia itself has any particular issues. But of course, they would say, well, Indonesia, if you don't want to be exposed to this, you don't have to borrow money from foreigners. Um, you can fund things yourself. And actually, that's what Indonesia has been doing. Um, so the central bank has effectively been printing money, uh, debt monetization. It's been buying government bonds um, to try and keep things going. And the markets, international markets, have been okay with that so far, which, which is good. Um, so I think that sport Indonesia is a much needed short term stability. I think the longer term picture, it, it, it's hard to say. I think Indonesia at the end is going to need foreign capital, um, but it's better to target the long term direct investments in its infrastructure, in manufacturing, in other sectors uh, where that money can't just be pulled out. You know, when there's a global financial crisis, you can't just sell your, your factory in uh, central Java uh, in the way that you can send your Indo sell your Indonesian government debt. But the problem is, because of the tensions in Indonesia between kind of protectionism and openness, you know, Indonesia hasn't found the right mix of investment rules to attract the direct long-term foreign investment it needs. So I think the key has to be sort of opening up those kind of long-term areas for investment and less reliance on short-term money. So that at least the government has the cash it needs, um, you know, to get through its day-to-day -day issues. But then I think it's going to need much deeper reform uh, to tackle these kind of fundamental health and health and educational inequalities, uh, without which I think Indonesia is not going to be able to live up to the high expectations of, of many investors, but also many Indonesian people who, you know, rightly want uh, the government to deliver better life and better prospects for them and their families. Sure. We, we were speaking a lot about in the, uh, Joko Widodo's you know, domestic policy, but I do want to ask you, you know, for a few minutes about his foreign policy. Um, specifically because uh, the two most important countries, I suppose, would be Australia and China. Uh, I remember back in the late eight, in the late 90s, early 2000s, the re relationship with Australia was quite tense. Uh, there were daily demonstrations outside the Australian embassy. Uh, they, many Indonesians blamed Australia for East Timor breaking away. I mean, what has uh, Joko Widodo done for the Australia relationship and how is Indonesia's relationship with Australia today? Well, on the protest, I think you can never read too much into those protests because it's pretty easy to rent a crowd in Indonesia. I remember after, I think, 
uh, the mayor of Oxford in, in the UK had sort of received some Papuan independence leader. There was a protest outside the British embassy in Jakarta and I went along to have a chat to people and they were shouting these slogans about crush Britain, down with Britain, down with the British. And I went up to a student to interview them and they said, oh, where are you from? I said, oh, from, I'm from England. He said, oh, England, which football team do you support? So um, he wasn't really that bothered. He didn't want to crush me. We had quite a nice chat. Um, uh, Indonesian foreign policy, I think, as I said at the beginning, it's always been framed by this desire to maintain strategic autonomy, to try and avoid too many foreign entanglements. Um, I think the relationship with Australia is actually as good as it's ever been in recent years. Um, I think both sides have developed uh, quite a reassuring level of maturity to handle the disputes that inevitably crop up when you have two neighbours that are so different economically, socially, politically and culturally and have a lot of overlapping security issues. Um, so I think they've developed some good mechanisms to, to balance out the, the inevitable fights that happen. Um, so when they've happened in the last couple of years, both governments have avo avoided the histrionics of old, withdrawing ambassadors and the like. So I think that's, that's reassuring on that front. Um, with China, it's interesting. COVID-19 uh, has hit hard and I think it's probably likely to increase Indonesia's reliance in a sense on China because the Chinese investment dollars into quite a few big infrastructure and resource projects have still been flowing into Indonesia. That's really necessary. And Indonesia is also looking to the Chinese vaccine, which is now undergoing late stage test clinical trials in Indonesia. And Jokowi, without a clearer policy on COVID, he's basically betting on the vaccine. And, you know, he really needs the Chinese vaccine as well as other efforts to pay off. So that gives, in a way, a kind of certain lever of power uh, for the Chinese. But Jokowi is ultimately a pragmatist. So he sees foreign policy as a tool to grow the economy. That, so if there's Chinese investment, that's good. If there's investment from anyone else, uh, he wants the most money with the fewest conditions. But he obviously has to balance that against these sovereignty questions. So when China has pressured Indonesia's shipping um, in its exclusive economic zone, he's had to make these kind of symbolic moves to push back but he hasn't actually increased Indonesia's overall capacity to defend its waters, to defend its exclusive economic zone, um, because he doesn't really want to get into that great power game. He wants to keep out of trouble as much as possible. And I think that frustrates a number of people in Canberra and obviously in, in Washington too, because they want to see Indonesia as this kind of third force, if you like, in Asia, pushing back against China. But Indonesia wants to play a cooler, more subtle, balanced game. In practice, of course, the Indonesian military does much more in terms of training and exercises with the US and with Australia than it would ever do with the People's Liberation Army. But at the same time, Indonesia is doing more nowadays in investment with China than it's doing with the others. So it's this delicate balancing game and Jokowi, by and large, just wants to avoid trouble and protect the economy, and which is understandable, I think. A similar yeah. attitude in many Southeast Asian nations. Yeah, the relationship with China with Indonesia is relatively new. I mean, you know, over the last couple of decades, I you know, during the Suharto years, I mean, for a long time, uh, you couldn't display Chinese language signs and Chinese language schools weren't allowed. Yeah, so things have really kind of changed quickly there. I remember in the late 80, late 90s, they burned down Chinatown and won some of these riots. Is there still that kind of anti-Chinese sentiment among the population or has that dissipated now? I think there are two interlocking issues here. One is the kind of long running resentment, um, racism towards ethnic Chinese Indonesians, which goes back hundreds of years to the colonial era. And some people say it's related to economic inequality because many of the country's richest business people are ethnically Chinese. But of course, there are many ethnic Chinese Indonesians who are not tycoons as well. So there's this long running tension. And that's at various times in history connected to the foreign policy, right? Uh, including in the 1960s when Sukarno was seen to be leaning too close to China. Um, so I think a lot of Suharto's measures to kind of shut down the Chinese community was a domestic play to try and use Chinese tycoons to fund him and back him, but make sure they were kept out of politics. So he was playing a domestic balancing game. But the anti-Chinese sentiment broadly is, is still there in certain pockets. We saw it in 2016 and 17, when there was this ultimately successful campaign to oust the governor of Jakarta, who was an ethnic Chinese Christian, formerly Jokowi's deputy governor. Um, so that's still there. We see a lot of anti-Chinese disinformation on the Indonesian internet, talking about you know, millions of Chinese workers being brought in or Chinese workers spreading the coronavirus, which obviously isn't true. 
Um, so that's that's still there. But amazingly, you know, the government to government relationship is getting you know quite strong, despite the fact that communism is illegal in Indonesia as, as a result of what happened in the 1960s. So you can have these very strange situations as at the end of last year when Moldoko, who's former head of the military, he's Jokowi's chief of staff. Um, he went to meet the Chinese ambassador in Jakarta and they had a discussion about many things, including the Xinjiang issue. And during this meeting, Moldoko expressed his sympathy, but not for the 20 million fellow Muslims um, in Xinjiang who are suffering under communist oppression right now. He expressed his sympathy for the Chinese government, which he said was the victim of hoax attacks. Um, so I think you can see the Indonesian military's fear there of outside intervention of the West telling them what to do is greater than their fear of the Chinese Communist Party. So kind of the world we live in can lead to these very strange alliances being created. Yeah, alliances of contradictions, I guess we call it. <laughs> And, and one more thing, you know, we got a time for a couple more questions. I do want to ask you, because we talked a little bit in the beginning about the role and power of Islam in, in, in Indonesia. Uh, I find that one of the biggest contradictions of Indonesia, because on the one hand, I, I see and I read now about how uh, they have this sort of creeping Islamization. But on the other hand, you know, when I go there, it seems kind of a pretty cosmopolitan place. They have, you know, disc, all night discos and clubs and nightclubs, et cetera. I mean, how, how, what's the what's the battle? How do you see it going? Which way is it going to go? <laughs> well, I think I see it in a similar way to these questions about the economy and the questions about democracy. This goes back to Indonesia's founding in 1945, when there was a debate between the secularists who wanted Indonesia to be a purely secular, multi-faith, pluralistic nation, and Islamists who wanted to have Sharia law, uh, Islam written into the constitution. And they ended up with this kind of muddy compromise by which Indonesia is not actually secular, it's technically a religious state, but with six official religions of which Islam is one. So it's a very strange compromise. Indonesia is one of the only, uh, at least very few, majority Muslim countries that has no Islam in its constitution officially, but it is religious. And we've seen this tension play out ever since in a number of uprisings, uh, you know, big move, social movements of Islamization, political contestation. Um, so overall, it has been a big battle. I think things now are definitely much more stable in a sense than uh, various times in Indonesia's far past. But it certainly seems in the last 10 or 20 years after Reformasi, there has been something of a religious revival. You know, people will tell you that the hijab is far more common now than it was 20 years ago. People will tell me that, you know, there's an increase in kind of more hardline preachers at various mosques at the margins. But then if you look at the election results in Indonesia, uh, the broadly Islamic parties have never been able to get more than 30% of the vote. And sometimes the Islamic parties focus on uh, mundane everyday issues like reducing the motorbike tax. And sometimes it's the supposedly secular parties promoting Sharia law for their own benefits. So it's a very confusing picture. And I think this, this uneasy compromise is still there. And various politicians are going to look to you exploit these splits for their advantages, which happens in a lot of polarized societies. And Indonesians themselves will change how they feel about things. I mean, I think to, to a great extent, the kind of growing Islamization, if you like, is partly to do with the middle class getting richer and sort of expressing your religion is just another commodity. It's like buying, buying a new car or buying a new house. You know, you upgrade your religion as a sign of, of how you're feeling about, about life. So uh, Indonesia remains a deeply religious country. I think the latest Pew survey has it as the, the most religious country in the world where something like 98% of Indonesians thinks you know, God uh, should be at the heart of morality and politics. And that actually goes for Christians and others in Indonesia, as well as Muslims. Okay, well, the book is called Man of Contradictions. Uh, I urge everybody to take a read. It's really, it's, it's actually not a long book. It's easy, an easy read. But before I let you go, I ask this, we ask this of all of our speakers. Uh, besides your own book, what else are you reading? What, what's, your, what's your pandemic reading going on for this next uh, the next few months. Anything interesting you can recommend? Yeah, I can, I can recommend a great book called The Secret World by Christopher Andrew. Um, it's a history of intelligence and espionage. Um, but rather than starting with the CIA and the KGB and the Mossad and the usual suspects, it starts with the Romans and the Greeks and the art of war. 
Uh, so it's a really fantastic effort to write a history of the world uh, from ancient times through the lens of espionage and the role it plays. And you, you really learn from, from Chris Van Andrew, who's a professor at Cambridge University, you know, just how our leaders keep repeating these same mistakes. You know, the spies will always come back with the threat they've been sent out to find, which is good. The only problem is it doesn't always exist and they'll find it whether or not it exists as we've seen from WMD to, to everything else. So it's a really fantastic book, really well written, really interesting and really ambitious global scope, which, which I appreciated. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that recommendation. And I will recommend uh, Man of Contradictions uh, by Ben Blant. Thank you for coming and joining us. You did not contradict uh, yourself here today. <laughs> Very concise and coherent. So thank you, for, uh, thank you for joining us. And we really do hope we can see you in Hong Kong in person sometime soon. This is your old home, right? So. Exactly. Hope to be back soon. Thanks, Keith. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here at this FCC Zoom event. And please tune in to go to FCCHK.org for future events in the calendar. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a good day. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>